Hi there, and welcome to part two of my GIS for Geography Teachers series. Um, so last time I just gave a very broad introduction to what geographical information systems are, what makes them unique, and thinking a little bit about some of the types of questions that we can use them to answer. Now, one of the things that probably makes GIS a little bit daunting for newcomers is the fact that we're working with types of data that you may not have worked with before if you've not encountered GIS. Um, but as I said last time, actually, they're still quite straightforward data sets once you understand the differences um, and what you can, can do with them. So as I've said here, um, our main types of data are rasters, vectors and tables. So let's have a look at what our data types are in, in GIS. So really when we're working with GIS, we can kind of think about our data sets as being made up of three things. Um, and this is a kind of broader view before we actually get to specific data types. So to visualize something in GIS, we need to first of all have some kind of building blocks and the technical term for these is entities. And these are basically the features that are going to be drawn on the screen as part of our map. And these could be points, um, it could be lines if we're showing roads or rivers, um, it could be areas or polygons if we're showing something like buildings, or it could be what we call pixels in the same way that we have pixels in a, a digital photograph, little squares that make up a continuous um, coverage across the area and they can be used to display a whole range of things um, varying from a straightforward photograph to height to pollution levels. So we have a range of kind of different building blocks that we can use and obviously different types of entity or building blocks are good at representing different types of, of features. Uh, obviously points are great at indicating things that are happening at a particular point, um, could be locations of streetlights, um, locations of crime events, locations of animal observations, um, lines, as I said, things like roads, rivers, and polygons, anything that contains an area from buildings to field boundaries to administrative districts, um, anything that's contained within an area, and rasters at things that are continuous across whole areas. But I'm gonna to come to these all in more detail in just a minute. And then linked to these building blocks, we have what we call attributes. So attributes are essentially information about the object. So this can be as simple as different colors representing different types of features, particularly if we're using a, a raster layer, or it could be basically an Excel spreadsheet that sits behind the, the data. So if we click on a point, it has a whole row that has say, house name, house number, house age, what it was built from, all kinds of bits of information that lie behind that single point and give us more information about that, that feature. So we have building blocks, entities, the objects that make up our map, and then we have attributes, the information that sits behind it. And then we have the spatial relationships between these features. So this is what allows us to, to carry out analysis. And to be honest, most of the time, we don't need to worry about this right-hand side unless we're getting into kind of more complex GIS. Um, but it's just useful to know that in the background, you know, the GIS software that we're using is considering these spatial relationships. How are objects positioned um, and how do they relate to each other? Um, this is particularly important for things like networks. So if we just have, say, points showing where crimes occurred and a series of polygons that show um, local districts, then you know our spatial relationship can be as simple as, okay, these points fall within this district. If we're looking at things like networks, for example, we need slightly more complex relationships because actually our features are going to connect with each other and we need to know what happens at this junction. Is it a right-hand turn only, for example, or is this road one way so we can only move down it in one direction? And um, these, these kind of relationships, again, allow us to carry out more complex analysis. So most of the time, 
this isn't something that we really need to worry about, but it's useful to be aware in the background that you know these relationships exist and are being considered. So let's move into our kind of two main data types that we work with within GIS. And as I've said already, these are vector data and raster data. And the way to tell one from the other basically is if you zoom in as far as you can on the map, vector data will always look nice and sharp and crisp. Whereas raster data, as you zoom in, like on the right hand side image here, will start to break down into individual pixels, exactly as if you zoom in on a, a digital photograph on the, on the screen. So if you're ever not sure what type of data you're working with, you know, that's the easiest thing to do, zoom in on it. If it's nice and sharp and crisp, then it's probably vector data. If it eventually breaks down, Okay, so what is raster data? So as I said, most people will be familiar with this through digital photographs because it's exactly the same. Um, so a raster file is basically made up of a grid of squares or rectangles, um, regularly shaped, and each of those squares or rectangles has one or more values associated with it. And we refer to each of those squares as a pixel, which stands for picture element. So if we take the example of a digital photo, actually a digital photograph has three values for each of those pixels and they relate to the three colours that we can see. So the human eye can see red, green and blue and every colour that we see is a combination of those three mixed together. So a colour photograph for each pixel has one value that um, says how much red light there is, one that says how much green light there is and one that says how much blue light there is. And that's kind of illustrated in this um, image on the, the right hand side here. Uh, we can actually store other information in rasters. As I said, anything that's continuous, basically rasters are, are good for um, representing. So height is a great example, height data. We can represent in other ways, but actually one of the best ways to represent it is as a raster, because that means every area we click on is covered by a pixel and that pixel contains an average height for the area that it, it covers. Um, now each pixel has what we call a resolution and again that's something you'll probably be familiar with from digital photography, the resolution of a, an image, how many squares it's made up of. In GIS what we're mostly worried about is how big that square is on the ground. So a raster image could have a resolution of one meter, which means each of the, the squares that makes it up is one meter by one meter um, on the sides. If we have satellite imagery, for example, then we may have resolutions of say 30 meters. So every square is 30 by 30 meters um, on the ground. Or in some cases, it could even be a kilometer. So we can have all kinds of raster resolutions raising, ranging from centimetres to kilometres, depending on what we're looking at. But what that refers to is how big each pixel is um, on the ground. So, sorry, I got ahead of myself with my presentation there. Um, but essentially, that's how rasters work. So a series of squares um, of regular size and a number, one or more values associated with each of those squares, which could be a colour if it's a, an image, a photo or a satellite image, um, or could be a height, it could be a pollution level, anything else that we're trying to represent continuously across an area. And as I said, that's what rasters are good for really, showing continuous data. What they're not so good for is showing individual objects, so buildings for example. We could do it, um, you know, we could have a raster layer where we colour in the pixels that contain the building in a particular colour and leave the others blank or colour them in different colours to represent um, what's happening in, in that area. But actually, if we're just interested in buildings, that's not a very efficient way to, to show them. And the other limitation of raster data is it can't have complex attributes. So our building, if we were to show it as a raster, 
we could have a colour or a number that says this is a building. Um, but we couldn't store information that says how old is this building or how high is this building, you know, how many floors does it have, how many bedrooms does it have, whatever information. It would be quite difficult to, to represent that with a, a raster. Um, and that's where our other type of data, um, vectors, is more powerful. Um, oh, and this is just a, a final note on formats. Basically, anything that you've come across before as an image file is a raster file. So JPEGs, PNGs, IMG, um, you may have come across TIFF files. Uh, there's a few kind of more esoteric formats which are a bit more unique to, to GIS and remote sensing as well. But basically, if you know it's an image, then it's a, a raster file. So vector data is a bit different. Rather than being made up of this continuous grid, it's made up of essentially a series of points, each point represented by coordinates. Um, so the basic kind of building block of vector data is a point represented by a pair of coordinates, x and y. And then we can use those points to create lines by essentially having points connected together. So each point along the line has a pair of coordinates and we have a line connecting them. And then if we want to create an area, we're simply linking the last point back to the first point to create um, an enclosed area or polygon. So all vector data is made up of a series of points which can be connected to make lines and joined up at the end to make polygons. And because of these coordinates, as I said, no matter how far we zoom in, the coordinates are always precise. Um, now, whether they're that accurate is another matter. Um, but on the map, they'll always appear precise. And we could zoom in to, you know, kind of real size or even closer so that, you know, our, our whole monitor represents a few centimetres and we would still see the line going crisp and sharp across the, the middle of the, the screen. So that can be misleading because it doesn't necessarily mean the data is actually that accurate, but they form kind of clean, precise boundaries. And each of our features within a vector data set has what we call an attribute table linked to it. And an attribute table is pretty much an Excel spreadsheet. Um, in fact, in some of the GIS data types, we can open up the attribute table directly in Excel um, from the, the file. So if we were to click on one vector feature, so in the image on the right here, I've got this blue line on the map. So this is a, um, a road or a pathway represented um, in a, a vector data set. So it's made up of a series of, of points connected with lines. And the blue line indicates the one that I've selected. And that corresponds to this row within the, the attribute table. So we can see here it's got an ID number. Um, it's a, a line type polyline. It's got an ID, um, or several ID numbers, in fact. And we can see that actually this is a bicycle route um, is essentially what the the data is showing. But we can have all kinds of things stored in attribute tables. So text, numbers, um, web addresses, all kinds of things can be stored in the attribute table. So we have a whole range of information about each individual feature that's represented on our map. And this is really useful if we want to interrogate this data because we can use those attributes to just select certain, certain types of features that meet our requirements. So example, I just want bicycle routes and I want to ignore all other types of road. Or I just want buildings that were built before 1900, for example. So having this attribute data allows us to investigate and interrogate our data set more easily. And these are effectively kind of the, the flip side to raster data in a lot of ways. So these are very good at showing individual features. Um, but actually not so good for showing continuous data. And as I kind of skirted around earlier, it is possible to show continuous data as vectors. And probably one of the most common ways to do it is um, contour lines. So, you know, if you're looking at an ordnance survey map, actually contour lines give us a way of trying to represent continuous heights, but by only showing particular lines. And we can kind of then 
guess essentially, sort of visually interpret what's happening between those lines. But generally speaking, a vector is better for showing discrete features, whether that's points, whether it's lines, or whether it's areas. Um, it can have, as we've said, complex attributes, and we can actually have overlapping features, which is something that we can't easily, again, represent with a raster data set. We've got kind of a value, and it's one thing or another, whereas we could have you know, two areas that actually overlap with each other, um, different types of pollution, for example. We could have kind of areas that are formed and, and overlap. It doesn't have to be um, distinct. And as I said, the thing to be careful of with vector data is that the kind of false impression of precision that it, it gives. You know, if we've gone out and collected data using a GPS on a phone, that's probably accurate to within about five metres generally, if we've not under trees and we've got a pretty good GPS signal. Um, but we could zoom in on our map on that data and it would look as if it was accurate to within a millimetre. So we do have to be a little bit cautious. You know, data could have been collected very roughly just by drawing on a paper map and then digitised into GIS and only be accurate to within 100 metres. It would still look millimetre precise when we look at it on the map. So that's the, the kind of biggest thing to, to be aware of in many ways with, with vector data is this kind of false impression of, of kind of precision that, um, you know, no matter how far we zoom in, it gives us this sharp, crisp boundary, no matter how accurate it was when the data was first collected. So there are other data types as well, but 90 nine percent probably of the work that we do in GIS uses raster and vector data set. Um, types you might come across are triangular irregular networks. This is another way of representing things, continuous surfaces, things like elevation data in a more vector-like way. So we have a, a series of points and all of those points are collect connected together to make a triangular mesh, a bit like when you see uh, wireframe images on, on TV, for example, when people are doing 3D modelling. Um, but they're much less common than using a raster layer, really, to, to represent things like elevation. Um, things like unstructured meshes are even more advanced. They tend to be used for things like um, ocean current data or wind speeds. Often, um, they're often used to represent kind of velocity and movement data, but again, they're a kind of much more advanced data type that unless you're really pushing things, you're, you're unlikely to come across. Um, I did mention tables and essentially the tables link to our attribute data. So, you know, you saw that the attributes table that we have when we're working with vector data. And actually it is possible for us to link other, say, Excel spreadsheets. If we've got a common field, say a postcode, for example, we could actually link those tables together. So we could have one layer that contains districts with postcodes or postcode areas and another data set that we went out and collected that we linked with the postcode and we could join those two data sets together. Again, that's a slightly more advanced task, uh, but it's something that I'll probably try and cover at least at a basic level further down the line once I get into to the practical sessions. But as I said, rasters, our regular grids of pixels um, used for representing continuous data and vectors made up of points and lines uh, which can be connected to make areas and have an attribute table behind them are what we're going to use for pretty much all common GIS tasks. So hopefully that has given you a brief overview of these main GIS data types, like I said, you know, we don't really need to worry about much at this point beyond rasters and vectors. And until you start using them, it probably is still a little bit fuzzy as to exactly what they do, what they look like, how we use them. Um, but don't worry, because that's exactly what I'm going to, to get on to next time. But I just think it's useful to have a little bit of theory in mind before we start getting our hands um, dirty, as it were, with the uh, practical stuff. So next time I'm actually planning to break it down into two parts. Um, essentially one 
being getting started with ArcGIS Online, which as I mentioned last time is an entirely browser-based GIS system that is freely available to schools, certainly in the, the UK. Um, it's slightly limited in some senses in what it can do, although it's still a pretty powerful tool. It has lots of data sets already there and it does allow you to carry out some basic analysis tasks. Um, the other option is QGIS, which is a free open source piece of GIS software. So anybody can download it. And QGIS is really a kind of professional level GIS application. Although again, once you've got to grips with the basics, it is actually quite straightforward to to use. Um, so, and a selling point really for QGIS is this is something that you know, people do use on a professional level in the, the real world. And you know, I think sometimes with, with students, I've found you know, having this sense that they're doing what professionals would be doing actually is can be a way to, to kind of engage them with the, the work as long as it doesn't scare them too much. So ease them in, ease them in gently. But I've used this with year 10 students and they've got on really well um, using QGIS for a crime mapping exercise. So, you know, I wouldn't be too daunted by it. Don't rule it out. Um, it's, it's a great piece of software. Um, like I said, anybody can download it and use it at home. And in some ways, being less reliant on an internet connection once you've got it downloaded and installed can be an advantage for, for some work. So that's next time. Um, so keep an eye out for essentially two videos, one looking at ArcGIS Online and one looking at getting started with QGIS. Um, and as I've said before, if you did enjoy that, please do like and subscribe because that helps to support me and get my videos out there. And if you have any questions or requests, then do just post a, a comment below and I'll do my best to